Oh, hi there. So, in my videos reviewing Aaron Frost's book, Christian Body, highly recommended by the way, you can find a link to that playlist right here. But uh, in one of those videos, I mentioned this uh, little situation, this little story, little concept known as Pavlov's dogs. Let's talk about that. For those of you who may not have heard of this before, there are links down in the description below if you want to go read up a little bit on Pavlov's dogs. There's stuff going on outside. I am outside. And um, you can read up on Pavlov's dogs in the description down below. There are a few articles down there. No, they are not super long, in-depth, detailed articles about all the nooks and crannies of the whole Pavlov's dogs thing, okay? They're just popular articles that'll give you the basic rundown of how the experiments worked and what they found out and stuff like that. So let's move on. So, Pavlov's dogs refers to a prolonged experiment in which a man named Ivan Pavlov um, worked with some dogs. There it is. Uh, you're welcome. What he did was he would ring a bell before he would feed the dogs. And uh, the dogs figured out that the bell meant food. And so after enough iterations of this experiment, Pavlov would ring the bell without feeding the dogs. And what he found was that the dogs would still salivate. Their, their, their mouths would still start to prepare. I guess, uh, did they drool? Sounds like they drooled. Anyway, they started to salivate just from, their mouths watered, that's the term. Their mouths had watered just from hearing the bell because the bell usually meant food. What the experiment shows is that classical conditioning is possible, namely that paired stimuli can become artificially associated over time. This makes it to where the response to the unrelated stimulus actually seems as automatic as the related stimulus. For example, let's look at the related versus the unrelated stimulus. So for these dogs, the related stimulus would be, and this is not terminology that I think Pavlov used, this is just me speaking off the cuff right now. The un related unrelated distinction, that's purely mine. I don't know if anyone else has ever said it before, but I'm just gonna say it for the purposes of this video. So the related stimulus obviously would be the food because that's related to their hunger and to the salivation. So that's the direct related stimulus. The unrelated stimulus is the bell because the bell is not food. <laughs> it's just a signal that the dog learns to associate with food. So um, yeah, so classical conditioning would, would say, if I recall correctly, that um, it's possible to take an unrelated stimulus and give it an artificial, rea an artificial reaction that's associated with the related stimulus or that would otherwise be associated with the original related stimulus. I'm, I'm not speaking so good today. <laughs> so I don't personally know what became of Pavlov's dogs after the experiments. I don't know if he released them or sold them or put them up for adoption. I don't even know if he killed and ate them. Okay, I don't know what happened to the dogs. But let's work through this as a thought experiment and say that Pavlov sold the dogs off to good homes. Now let's imagine that you are a regular family dog at a dog park and you meet one of these retired Pavlovian dogs. The retired dog walks up and starts sniffing your butt. Because that's how dogs say, Hi, I'm Jimbo. Nice to meet you. What's your name? What do you do for a living? What kind of dog food do you eat? What does your poop smell like? What? What? So this retired dog says to you, Yeah, well this morning my master's phone rang and I just started drooling all over the place. <laughs> you know how that is. And then you, the family dog, just kind of look at the retired dog for a second and you say, no, no, I, I actually don't know how that is. What are you talking about? The retired dog says, you know, the bells. Oh, come on, the bells. When a dog hears a bell ringing, he drools. It's just how dogs are. That's life, man. You know what I'm talking about. Dude, I have never heard that before. You really drool just from hearing a freaking bell? Yeah, of course I do. Don't you? Of course I don't. It's a freaking bell. It's made of metal, my guy. Are, are, are you good? Are you like, are, are you okay? Because drooling from a bell is not normal dog behavior kind of stuff. Of course it's normal. If you don't drool from a bell, then then then, then you're either lying to me or, 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 or you're just lying to yourself. 
these dogs would have essentially zero common ground on this issue because the Pavlovian dog sees drooling from a bell as a universal innate trait of dogs. And it's just self-evident this is how dogs are. And then the non-Pavlovian non family dog thinks that it's universal, innate, and self-evident that dogs don't drool from just hearing a bell. And so what's funny is these dogs would both come to this conclusion and be confused about the other one and wonder if the other one was okay. Patreon time. This episode of Mudwalkers is, in fact, brought to you by Patreon. These guys are my patrons. They're making the channel possible. They're keeping my work sustainable. I cannot thank them enough for what they do, for what you do, on Patreon. If you're interested in becoming a monthly patron, there's a link to that down in the description down below. Down in the description down below. And there's also going to be a link up here in a moment uh, to Patreon slash Mudwalkers. And um, it Patreon pays for... Um, a lot of the stuff that I get to do as a content creator. It, um, it helps justify the hours that I spend uh, every week, not just shooting, but also making scripts, making plans, going on trips. Uh, I just went to Cypress Cove and recorded some stuff for the channel. There was a whole vlog about that on Patreon. And I'm gonna be making more trips this year, thanks to Patreon. I'm gonna be able to go to some World Naked Bike Rides, which I'm really excited about, and spread the word. I'm gonna be able to meet more um, naturist content creators. Hopefully, we're gonna to try to make that happen. I'm gonna be able to talk to some Christian naturists that I would not have been able to speak with otherwise because of Patreon. So if you're interested in becoming a patron, uh, check out the link in the description down below. Oh yeah, there's also a monthly video call with me and the patrons. Most of the patrons are actually eligible for the video call at the $10 level and up. All the patrons are eligible for a monthly video call with me and all the other patrons. We do that the last Saturday of every month, typically. It's a great time to hang out and have fun and just, you know, talk and swap stories and share ideas and just generally get to know each other. I'm getting to meet fantastic people that I would never have gotten to meet outside of Patreon, and it's uh, one of the highlights of my month. So, besides that, I would be rambling, so let's get back to the video. Okay, okay, so we've had our simulated conversation between the Pavlovian dog and the family dog. Um, so you see, the family dog thinks that it's universal, innate, and self-evident that dogs do not tend to drool just from hearing a bell. And the Pavlovian dog thinks it's universal, innate, and self-evident that dogs always drool when they hear a bell. Go away, bug. Um, but how does that relate to modesty, the Bible, naturism, and all that stuff? Well, let's run the conversation again, in case you don't already see where this is going, and let's see how this relates to naturism in a more direct way. So let's imagine that a Christian man visits your church out of the country. And in his culture, uh, women always keep their hair covered. And if a woman uncovers her hair, it's seen as a, like a sexual gesture. So um, he goes to your church and none of the women in service are wearing anything on their heads. And uh, you see him like trying to keep his eyes down. He looks uncomfortable. And then like halfway through the, through the, the, the singing and stuff, you see him uncomfortably leave the service. So you, you, you know, naturally you walk after him and you catch up to him and you say, wait, 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 hey, what, like, are you okay? Like, what's, what's, what's going on? And he says, listen, I, 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 I don't know how you guys do it. I didn't know that American Christians were such perverts. You say, perverts? Like, well, where would you get that from? Your, your women are dressed like whores. We, we really, really prioritize modesty in this church. Like, what, what, what about our women's attire like, would you, lead you to believe that, that they're whorish? Like, what was it about them that, that looked like that? Are you serious? You, you, you're going to act like you just, like, don't notice. It's, it's their hair. It's their hair, okay? Everybody knows this, that when a man sees a woman's hair, he gets an erection. Like, so the only reason you could possibly have for just, like, running church this way. It's if you guys just want to walk around and just like ogle these women and just lust after them through the whole service. You guys are such, uh, such, such creeps. Let's look what's wrong with you. <laughs> um, what, what you, you, you really get turned on just from seeing a woman's hair. All men do. It's just how men operate. We're visual creatures. When we see a woman's hair, we lust. That's how it works. Mm, no, that's not how men work. Uh, that's never been how it works here. Um, I've been going to church my whole life like this, and I can tell you it's never once crossed my mind 
that just because a woman has her hair outside of a hat that that would somehow be an automatic turn on. If you're gonna stand here and tell me that the sight of a woman's hair is not sexually arousing to you, then there's only two possibilities. You're either lying to me or you're lying to yourself. We're, we're done. Goodbye. So if you, if you had this conversation, it, any Christian man in America would, would be able to see that this man is suffering from Pavlovian conditioning. There's nothing universal, innate, or self-evident about what he said about women's hair. The reason that this is so obvious, so obviously not true, is that we have lived it. But you get to that point with Pavlovian conditioning through conditioning. And Matt, put yourself in this man's shoes, okay? You're a, you're a, little, you're a little kid and you, you walk into your, your mother's room and she has her hair, she's combing her hair, brushing it or whatever it is that she's doing. And uh, she sees you, her eyes turn to the size of dinner plates and she screams, no, get out! And then your father gets home and he gives you a good stern talking to you about your mother's hair, son. And like all these things start to happen. So you start, you know, like cutting yourself off and like making sure you, you, you know, never see, come back here, never see a woman's hair. And then um, the only context in which you see hair is like, you know, those scenes in movies. You know, the woman starts to like pull back her hair and your mom goes, okay, we're stopping this scene. And so then like you start to like, so okay, that's what that means when a woman starts to show her hair is that like there's some kind of like encounter about to happen and, and like the girls at school and like, uh, then the girls at church or wherever and just like over and over and over and over, iteration after iteration after iteration, you get the ringing of the bell and you get the food and those two things being together, the sexuality and the hair appearing together over and over and over and over and over and over again and it's deliberately reinforced socially yeah, you're going to end up with a guy who gets aroused just from seeing hair, completely through Pavlovian conditioning. And it's obvious to us, right? Because we don't have that conditioning. So it's just obvious that's not the case. There are some cultures where what does it for people is knees or ankles or the back of the neck. I mean, uh, midriff, like imagine midriff being such a scandal that it would be like seen as pornographic. Like it's that serious sometimes. And so then a different culture, say like certain European countries where nudity is very common, they see Americans and they go, oh dude, like you've got some serious social conditioning going on if just seeing a breast like puts you into all, like ruins your whole day and stuff. Like dude, what, something's wrong with you, okay? That's some serious conditioning you got there. So let's put a bow on this with one more conversation. You're talking to a fellow Christian and um, you happen to mention that you sometimes visit naturist resorts and the guy's like, hey, like, that's not right. Just being around a naked woman is enough to automatically cause a man to lust. Well, and you say, well, that's just not true. I've done that before. I've been around lots of naturists of all ages in both sexes, men, women, boys, girls, like all the whole gamut. And I've never lasted after any of these people. He says, okay, there's gotta be something here that isn't true because that's not possible. Because when a man is around a naked woman, he will lust, okay? Um, that, that's the same true, it's true of me, it's true of every other man that I know, that as soon as we see any you know, nudity from a woman, we lust. And then you as a naturist say, that's just, it's, I'm telling you, I've been there, done that, and it doesn't work that way. And this Christian says, if you, if you are telling me that you can be uh, naked around a naked woman and not lust after her, there's two options. You're lying to yourself or you're lying to me. This conversation's over. And so I hope, if you're a textile, I hope you can understand from our perspective a little bit that when you come to us as naturists and tell us that what we experience every day isn't possible, you sound like the guy with the hair thing. You're, you're, you're clearly dealing with Pavlovian conditioning here. And that's part of what naturism does, it, is it helps you to get past, um, helps you to get past some of that conditioning. Um, how, how do you get a dog to stop associating bells directly with food? You, you start 
ringing bells without food for one, you start giving him food without the bell, and you make these two things unrelated so that they don't really intersect a lot, the dog realizes, oh, well, the sound of the bell doesn't actually have anything to do with food, and so he stops reacting to it the same way. Naturism happens, seems to work similarly. You get in this situation, and everybody's naked, and it's, it's like your brain goes, oh, oh, the... Okay, so this is a bell, but no food. You go, yes, brain, there is bell, but no food. Brain goes, huh, okay, and that's it. Humans really can change how they uh, react to various states of modesty. We already know this because um, people who live in stricter cultures can move to more liberal cultures when it comes to modesty, you know, more free cultures when it comes to modesty, and they adapt to it. A Muslim man who grows up in the Middle East and is around so, you know, hyper modesty all the time, he can move to the States and get used to seeing women, by his standards, half naked in Walmart. He, he can get used to that. Women can get used to that kind of thing too. We can adapt to all of this. We can even adapt to nudity. And by the way, I didn't start out as some kind of non-visually oriented, asexual person, freak of nature thing. Um, I was the stereotypical young American red-blooded male, okay? Um, lasting after women in skirts, lasting after women in long sleeve, short sleeve, spaghetti strap, low cut, high cut, revealing, not revealing, wearing a hat or otherwise, wearing shoes or otherwise, didn't matter, I didn't care. I was going to lust after a woman if she was in my presence, essentially. It was a dark time in my life. Um, very stereotypical. And yet, I got over that. Um, so I tell people all the time, if, if you're worried about not being able to get over this conditioning, not being able to get used to nudity, believe me, if I can do it, you can do it. Because I was exactly the way that people would expect me to be. I was exactly the way that the culture expects me to be. I was exactly the way that the, our culture conditions young men to be. If you'd like to hear more about my journey from lust into naturism and my freedom from pornography and lust, you can find that story right here in this video. Um, that's the whole long version of the story, which I can't get into in this video because it is a whole video unto itself, as you can see. Long story short, um, I studied the Bible and saw that it didn't require clothing and it didn't put, you know, uh, skin coverage forward as uh, a good method of preventing lust or sexual sin. So I looked elsewhere for the best way to uh, relate to clothing when it comes to lust. And when I discovered, you know, started reading about nudism online, um, I found a lot of people saying that it actually really, really helps with that problem. It helps you uh, not to lust, helps you get over pornography. So I thought, well, the Bible doesn't forbid it. And these Christians I'm reading from online say that it's really effective and it makes your life better, even spiritually and morally. So I thought, well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try this. I'm going to try. And lo and behold, it worked. Um, before you could say green beans and bacon, um, I got used to nudity. I could, I could be around uh, the, the first day that I was in a naturist resort, well, a nudist park. I could just be around naked women and it, it wasn't a... a big deal. I mean, it was a big deal, like in one sense, but it was a non-issue in an, a different sense. That, that's a whole ish, uh, video unto itself. You can find that one on my channel called um, My First Nudist Experience. But yeah, and all that really changed was just, you know, learning that it was um, permissible and possible. How many people do you know that wake up on a regular basis and jump on their feet, jump, and try to touch the moon. Yeah, me either. Um, how about people who try to swim from Virginia to Africa? Yeah, I don't know anybody like that either. Uh, what about people, uh, you know anybody who um, wakes up on a regular basis and tries to fly with their arms? Someone, you know, who's older than five, let's say. Um, no, I don't know anybody like that either. At least not outside of like a mental institution. Um, why don't people like give these things an honest try? Why don't they try to do these things? Because we already know they're impossible. 
as soon as you convince something, as soon as you convince someone that something is impossible, that person stops trying. So we raise our young men to believe and to experience that whenever they see a little too much of a woman's skin, it's impossible for him to resist lust. What, just how, how exactly do you expect him to react to that, pray tell? You expect him to resist? You just told him it's impossible. You raised him his whole life. Impossible, 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 impossible. The best he can hope for is just to avoid the stimulus in the first place. The problem with that, though, is that when you avoid a stimulus, it only intensifies the reactive um, behavior on the back end. So what happens if you keep yourself really, really, really warm? If you turn your thermostat all the way up to 80 degrees Fahrenheit in your house all the time, and then for the first time in your life, you walk outside and it's 25 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, guess what? You're going to freeze your little butt off. Okay? And the people out here, regular people who have been experiencing winter since they were this big, they're going to walk out in 25 degree weather, put on a really thick jacket, and they're going to function. But someone who's never encountered this before, you're in for a rude awakening. So how do you keep yourself from freezing to death on an ordinary winter day? You spend your whole life with some exposure to cold. But if you tell someone, if you go outside in below freezing temperatures, you will die. That person is not going outside. That person is going to do everything he can to avoid going outside on a cold day. When actually, if you want to increase your survival in the winter, you should expose yourself to cold on a regular basis to get your body used to that stimulus without overreacting. So you've done these young men a disservice on two fronts. Number one, you've taught them not to try by telling them that it's impossible. Number two, you've exaggerated the response by removing the stimulus in the first place. Oh, Chris, you seem angry. You're getting a little bit, you know, animated and mad here. Yes, yes, I am. I am legitimately angry. I have experienced this. I have woken up, lived a day, and gone to sleep miserable for several years of my life when I was younger because I was in this exact spot, being taught that it was impossible, and then knowing knowing that this impossible, this irresistible stimulus which is out there waiting for me at Walmart, on the sidewalk, and even at church was terrifying and soul-crushing. Because no one ever told me that it could be done. So what does naturism do? It, it teaches you that there can be a bell and no food. whoop de doo There's a naked body. Yay! Whatever. So if you ask a naturist man, oh, how do you, how do you be around all these naked people? and avoid the lust. And the naturist response is, what, what lust? Like, it's just, it's not an issue. It doesn't come up. But what, what does a naked body have to do with sex? What does it have to do with lust for that matter? It's, it's just a person. It's just a human being. As the hashtag do say, naked means human. When you get to a certain point in this adjustment of your mind when it comes to naturism, it's, it becomes less, it's not even, nudity anymore, because nudity seems to imply that something's missing, like it's, it's a lack of clothes. But to me, what, what nudity is, is humanity. So I don't see nakedness as a lack anymore. I see it as not being, there's nothing extra added on to it, if that makes any sense. It just means humanity. Now getting off the point, let me get back to possible and impossible. If you're a man watching this, um, you may very well need to hear this. So here's what I want to tell you. You can do this. It is possible. I didn't think I could do it, and then I did it. I got over lust. I got over porn, man. You can do this. You ever heard of someone who just lied and lied and lied all the time about stupid little things? Like, like why would you even lie about that? Just like constant lies. And this person turned a corner, stopped lying. I have. That was me. I used to lie all the time when I was younger. Um, I stopped. Or, or what about, you know, promiscuity? What about people who are sleeping around all the time? And then this person stops sleeping around. 
Ever heard of that before? I've heard of that. I know several people like that, actually. So you can do this. It's, it's a sin, okay? You can get over specific sins. But beyond you, let's take a step back and take this a step deeper for a second. If you are a Christian, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. What indwelt means is that He dwells in you. He is such an integral part of your life. It is as if He is inside your very cells. He is right there with you. Can Yahweh, can the Holy Spirit, can God help you get over lying? Can God help you get over pride and arrogance? Can God help you get over bitterness? Can God help you get over uh, strife and contention? Can God help you get over addictions? Can God help you get over physical diseases? Yeah. So, do you really, really think that he can't help you with lust? Of course he can. Of course he can help you with that. But like with everything else in life, you cannot simply pray, God, help me with my lust. God, help me with my lust and never do anything about it. Okay, that's like, that's like eating enough food for five people and weighing 400 pounds and then praying, and then after dessert praying, God, please help me to get healthy. Dude, look, what do you expect him to do when you're deliberately driving your health into the ground? Uh, so no, he may not help you as much as you want him to because you are making terrible decisions in your life. So pray for God to ask you, to, pray for God, ask him to help you with your anger while you put in the effort. Okay, okay. She said the thing again that she knows I hate, for her to say, deep breath, deep breath. Stacy, I get that you're having a bad day. And um, I see you, I hear you. I'm going to get it done by the end of the day. That's the plan. Okay, just stay calm, take a deep breath, put in the effort. You take your steps, Yahweh will take his when it comes to dealing with your problems, with your arrogance. Yeah, pray for God to help you with your arrogance, but not the way that the Pharisees prayed for their arrogance. You know, oh God, thank you that I'm so much better than this tax collector. And the Gentiles, oh, thank God I'm not a woman. Oh. <clears throat> Don't pray that way. Pray with actual intent to get better. Uh, pray with steps in place to get better. And I'm telling you, my friends, my brothers, if you are struggling with lust and pornography, then naturism is the way forward. Naturism will help you immensely, like it has helped, well, probably will help you immensely, like it's helped me and so many other people. That being said, um, Romans chapter 14 is very clear about the conscience. If you feel like it would be wrong for you to participate in naturism, then it would be wrong for you to participate in naturism because you feel that way. I don't feel that way. There's no rule against it, so I can do it. Romans chapter 14, the stronger brother has no problem with it, so he goes and does not The weaker brother does have a problem with it, so he doesn't do it. No big deal. We can coexist. We can stay brothers. But please work it out. Study it. And if you can get to a point where you realize that this really is okay, it can probably help you. Like I said, my social media links are in the link tree down below in the description of this video. If you want to reach out and talk about this stuff, if you want me to direct you to more resources, uh, if you want me to pray for you, um, then send me a direct message. I can't promise that I'll answer all the messages, especially as time goes on from this video. But um, don't, don't be afraid to try. And if you can't reach me, reach somebody. Okay? I, I want to help as many people as I can. Like I said, I suffered. I suffered with these problems. Uh, I'm still, I still bear the scars of, of, of that part of my life. And I want, I want to help you. I not only want to help you, I want to help our culture ensure that this problem shrinks over time instead of growing or even staying the same. We have the power in our hands to help this problem shrink over time. With the Holy Spirit in one hand and naturism in the other, we can do this. Well, not with the Holy Spirit in our hands. Maybe, maybe saying like holding God's hand on the one side and having naturism in the other hand. You know what I mean. There isn't a single problem in this life where the answer isn't in some sense Yahweh or Yeshua, Jesus. Because, I mean, death itself, He is the resurrection. He is life. 
He will bring us ultimate restoration. And our moral problems, our, our pride, our hate, our lust, these are problems he can help us with. He can help you with. Yes, you. Okay, you think I'm just pointing at the camera. You think I'm just pointing at the screen. I'm pointing at you. Okay? You can do this. The Lord can help you do this. Yahweh can help you with this. He's the ultimate solution to all of your real problems. All problems will ultimately be solved in the resurrection. At the end of all things, um, all the dead will be raised and Yahweh will call all of us to be held accountable for the lives that we've led and the orientation of our hearts. I'm, I'm taken care of. My resurrection is taken care of. What about yours? Some will be raised to be placed in a new earth. Some will be raised to be placed in a lake of fire. I hope that you're raised to the new earth. And if you are a Christian, brother, sister even, please, please consider naturism as an option. And also, maintain your own conscience through the entire thing, I beg of you. Anyway, wanted to give you that word of encouragement. You really can do this. I hope this video is inspiring, that it provokes some thought, and uh, that it's overall just, you know, helpful. That being said, that's it for this video, and I will see you in the next one.